Hi, everybody. Welcome back for our second panel of the day. This one on screenwriting. Um, before I start, I wanted to note that we want to thank the uh, for providing the breakfast that we all enjoyed in the back. So, just wanted to let you know about that. I don't know. Thank you for the chef thing. I appreciate it. People flooding to the exits. Missing out on a good panel. Um, Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Mitchell Bard again. Um, we're lucky today to have Lauren Paul Kaplan with us. I don't have the formal bio in front of me. Yes, we show up, but Lauren is uh, um, is an, an expert on storytelling, is the way I would put it. He's a longtime uh, screenwriting professor at, uh, at Columbia University, as well as the New School and Hofstra and a couple other places. Um, if you, if it's the hour of the day, it's a, he's usually teaching someone somewhere how to write a script. So. Um, he's also a, an accomplished uh, filmmaker, screenwriter himself, who's worked in and out of the studio system, poet, playwright, musician. Um, there's really nothing that he can't do. And one of the great things about Lauren is he's kept up um, with the industry and he's worked on video games and you know things like that. So it um, really comes down to storytelling. So we are so lucky to have Lauren here today. So let's give him a quick round of applause. Thank you. Lauren has a uh, sign up sheet. Lauren does script consulting and other things, and he has uh, an email uh, uh, newsletter. So if you want to sign up um, with your email, he'll, he'll keep in touch with you um, with some of his insights. So we're here to talk about Screenwriting. This, is, this, uh, this panel has been going on for quite some time. Uh, I've been doing it. I'm always, each year, kind of moved about the way things are changing and how to address uh, wh where we are. Um, this year, there, there are kind of a couple things that I've done recently that as it was happening, got me thinking that you know this panel is going to be happening and something that we should discuss. Um, I, I think I, I want to start. One thing was uh, you know we run uh, the the festival has a screenwriting competition every year. Um, we have the runner up here somewhere. I think I saw earlier right there, okay. Beth, right there, right. Yes. Uh, runner up is here, Beth Bollinger. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and as um, as we were reading the 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 the, the, the final scripts, um, and over here is my cohort in doing that. Um, we, uh, I, as I was reading them, I was, it's very interesting because one of the lenses through which I, I, I read these things is that, you know, I spent a lot of time in development, and I think in terms of if I was still a development guy and I was reading this, would I be passing this off to my boss as something that we would should try and get made, right? And what I noticed as I was reading it was, I no longer know what that means. In the, in the current environment, right? Like in a world with, with streaming services and peak TV and the decline of indie film studios and you know and and studios making Marvel movies and you know, I I I, I really was saying to myself, well, what do I mean by this? Where does a film like this end up, right? So that's my first question to you today: is like, when writers have a story idea and they sit down to write a script, what should they be think of as far as where this could actually end up? Because I think that affects the writing, right? So, totally. Yeah. Um, I, get, I don't know if you everyone knows, but Netflix is producing more films than all the studios put together. So, right off the bat, maybe it's nice if you know someone who has an in to Netflix. <laughs> because they're going to be doing a lot, of the, a lot of the films. And that also means they're going to be doing a lot of the smaller films as well. So, the smaller films, you know, are, are not the super indie, but they're the five to twenty million dollar movies which used to be called the smaller films and still are um, so yeah it, it's an interesting question streaming services are really important and more than important they are the platform so between I mean between Netflix Amazon and Hulu but now we have uh, iTunes is now on the coming and making original content um, so is YouTube and uh, so there's two or three others that are kind of entering that game of producing <coughs> really well-made <coughs> stuff. So I, I feel that some of the smaller movies that we've all loved in the past, and smaller movies are are movies that you know we would call even studio movies that were made for a, for a price. Uh, I mean, even Shawshank Redemption type movies, a good movie. That's not a small movie, but it's again you know, just a good story without without a lot of special effects. Good, sincere story. You know, where's the place for those anymore? And I think there are. I think there's increasingly places, but the streaming services are going to be buying a lot of this stuff up. So you know, how to do this stuff is, is a real. I think you've identified something really big. And in, in my course, is one of the things we're obviously 
being very well aware of <laughs> television, uh, not only is television as a end place to show the movies, you know, HBO and HBO, they all have fe films they will show. Um, but when you think of screenplays, a lot of times people, with agents and managers especially, will look at your feature and go, huh, is this a TV series? That's a lot of things they are asking. Can I market this as a, as a pilot for a series? And series seem to be obviously, not obviously, but you know, that seems to be dominating a lot of the, a lot of the attention. A lot, a lot of the air uh, in the discussion about narratives today is about new television series. But do you think that should affect how writers write their stories? Yes. Uh, well, listen. As an artist, you want to, the artistic parts of you, you want to not be restricted by the marketplace. Uh, you know, what do they say? When you're 19, if you're not a communist, you have no heart. And if you're 50 and you're not a capitalist, you have no head. So, <laughs> uh, I, I get it. You, you know, you, you want to have both. And you want to be able to be idealistic and, and somehow engage in stuff that is meaningful to you. At the same time, you have to understand that it's, it, it is a the film business, and it's a big business, and it's a business component. Uh, you know, here is kind of an independent world, and I I encourage independent world, especially for the first number of things. If you could figure out how to have a life while still being involved in the creative process, that to me is the ideal. I think things are changing in the world. Um, the '60s sort of. Uh, quote, democratize creativity. And at this point, when it's really financially stressful, um, it's hard to do that if you're not living off your parents. So consequently, you know, seems to me the, the challenge, because, you know, making it in the business in terms of making a lot of money, and, and, and we, we're kind of in an all or nothing culture. We, we've not become, there's not a lot of you know, it's, it's binary. It's like you're a success or you're not a success. And I think those are wrong terms because success is unrealistic. In, in Europe, there's a lot of, in England, where I'm familiar with, there's a lot of actors and filmmakers who are um, not big, wealthy, known person. They make a living. They make a living at doing this thing. And in our culture, we tend to think that if you do success, then it's a, you're a gigantic, huge thing. And I think if you could find that middle ground to have a life and still be creative and be involved in telling stories, that's the that's sort of the ideal. Now, I don't know if I've avoided entirely your question of it. Uh, does that you always do? <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like to think that I always expand on it. <laughs> avoid the question. I hope that I've partially included that information. But so, to be specific, if in fact your goal is to sell something to Hollywood, quote, and to make a living specifically off selling your script, quote, then you have to be aware of the marketplace and where that's going to go. But that's always been the case. So, you know, if you're writing some personal story about your grandma and you want Tom Cruise to be in it, that's probably the wrong thinking. You need to have to figure it out where it is in the marketplace that you're uh, approaching and where ideally you'd like to see your film to land. Is that more close? Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> um, another thing I noticed reading through the scripts this year that I don't know that I've seen as much of in the past um, was the, the, the final five scripts all had great pitches. Like all five of the scripts, yeah. if you just looked at the pitch, well, I'm not saying they would pitch, I'm saying what I would pitch if I were pitching it as a producer. Um, they all had great pitches. They would all get your attention. They were like, wow, this is something I'd want to see. A concept, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, where I think that things slipped really quickly, though, was with the execution of that concept in regards to structure, narrative, driving the plot forward, and everything. So in your students' work that you see on a regular basis, what are some some ways writers can think about to make sure that they're giving um, enough narrative drive, a lot enough structure to their ideas, so that their ideas are something that can actually be a movement. Um, well, good, great question. You know, I, I think I mentioned to you that I was recently asked to. You know, the Criterion Collection. You guys know that. So I was asked to be the the talking head on the re-releasing the Princess Bride, hmm. and uh, they wanted they couldn't get William Goldman who wrote the screenplay because he's kind of. Too old to do this at this point, so they're asking Lauren to 
talk about William Goldman's screenplay structure. And um, I said, you know, it's too bad we all love The Princess Bride, but it's not my favorite or his favorite movie. Uh, but if you look at Sun Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid, it really is more inventive in terms of what William Goldman was known for. <laughs> Again, I'm not avoiding a question. <laughs> uh, Ram, the same thing is about structure and how to tell a story. So we're starting with this sort of master storyteller, William Goldman. Uh, one big deal is the pitch should be clear by the end of Act One. That's a real tip off. So if you if you say this is what my story is about, yeah, the, the 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 woman. Uh, uh, his son is hiding because uh, Nazis are after him and secretly he's a transgender person. I don't know what it is, I'm just making stuff up. Um, that needs to be clear by the end of Act 1. And Act 1 is 25% of the whole. Considered by 25% of the whole, the audience should, the reader should have a real clear sense of where they think they're going. If it changes half an hour down the line, that's well and fine. But by the end of Act 1, the ride that you signed up for should be established. So the coming of attractions, they're trying to sell you the movie. That movie should be established by the end of Act 1. And again, this 25% is not a hard number. If it's 28%, if it's 32%, I don't know. You know, you got to entertain me until then. But by then, we should really, really be clear what this pitch is. And that's the big deal. Yeah, as you're saying, I get this concept, and sometimes that concept is not clear to the middle, or Act 2, or Act 3. And you really want that, the, the pitch concept should be really clear by, by the 25% mark. Yeah, I think that, so, that, I mean, that's, that is what I'm driving at. You know, I'd be reading and reading and reading, and I'd be on page 30 and 40, have no idea what the script is supposed to be about. So how are there are there kind of specific hands-on things that writers can do? So I guess let me ask the question another way, and that is, you know, if you anyone can go out and buy a screenwriting book, right? And they have all the quote-unquote rules, right? You know, a five-part structure. You need an inciting incident. You need the first act. The mid midpoint mid climax, second act climax, third act climax, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, obviously, if you follow that five-part structure, you will have more of a structure than if you just Right, right. But are you a believer in that, or do you think there are other ways that are better ways to structure a script? So I'm aware of the five part and six part, and there's all kinds of high parts, and everyone's written a book about it. Uh, and I've been asked to write a book about it as well, and I haven't. Um, but I basically say beginning, middle, and end. I keep it real simple. And I want to keep a lot of room for creativity, because just when you think you have a formula down, someone comes from the left field, and that's where all the birds flock. And, uh, but we all have a beginning, middle, and end. Even if you don't agree with so-called structure, 25, 50, 25% in terms of act one, two, and three, no one disagrees you walk in the theater at minute one, you walk out at minute 120, and something happens in the middle. I mean, we, in linear time, <laughs> no one can disagree with that. I think you've cracked the whole screen right now. <laughs> yeah, kinda, kinda, but I have people, you know, who, who are like, Oh, it's just it's that cliche three act structure. I said, well, yeah, you walk in, you walk out. <laughs> you know, something happens in the middle, and uh, it's 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 the reality of the time space that we're in. So, given that, how do I entertain you within that hour and a half or two hour period? And where do I put these marks? I actually don't teach the five act structure, but I do teach this basic three act structure, and I look for, and, you know, it's funny. I've been doing this a long time and written a lot about it, in my own writing especially, but at the end of the day, these terms, you know, and you've, if you've read the books, you've heard these terms, inciting incident, turning points, midpoints, all these kinds of things. And, and don't throw them out, but a lot of people have different terms for them. You'll find debates. Is it the turning point or is it the, is it the inciting incident? You know, which one it, well, all I say is the meta information below those terminologies on that timeline is that some shit happens in the beginning early on <laughs> to get you involved. Some shit happens 20, 15, 20 minutes down, 25 minutes down the line to keep you. And then, keep, then you know, it, it's, it's not brain science in terms of being a storyteller and just keeping people involved and, and, and in it. I mean, it is brain science to do it really well. but But uh, there's a famous action producer who would always tell his writers, I need an explosion every 10 minutes. <laughs> so, 
Essentially, <laughs> if it's a romantic comedy, you need a version of an explosion. You need an emotional explosion. And this is another way to tell uh, to tell you how to keep it interesting. When you watch sports, it's a boring game if nothing happens. It's an exciting game if stuff almost happens or things do happen. And that's this. This is what we're trying to articulate. Yeah. Um, Another experience I had that I made me think of this panel was about two months ago, I was um, meeting my cousin, he was visiting New York, we met in Manhattan, and a friend of his that I'd never met before came along, and my cousin says, oh, you know, um, he knows a lot about film, why don't you tell him about the movie you want to make? So the guy decides to pitch me on the movie he wants to make, so I ask him the question, what is it about, right? And I'm used to hearing a pitch, you know, everything. And his response was something along the lines of, and I'm not being completely accurate because it was so long ago, but to give you an idea, it's about the human condition. It's about the way people function in a society where things are changing at a pace that they can't handle. Okay. And he stopped. And I was like, Good. is there a main character? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, I, and, I, what I, and the reason it made me think that is, again, I think, I think everyone thinks they have a quote-unquote great idea for a movie. But that's very different than actually having a great idea for a movie, you know what I mean? Because movies have to be able, th that, that when you have that idea, it has to be able to sustain for 120 pages, all right? So I would imagine, since you work with college kids a lot, well, they come in with more of the human condition than the, I've got this idea for a character who does these nine things. How do you work with a writer to get from the human condition to the story about, in this case, it was about a real life story about the first Latin American, um, it was like a, um, fighting for the rights of something or another, you know what I mean? <laughs> I kind of wish more of my students were concerned about the human condition, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Uh, and I call that theme, <clears throat> you know, and you could talk about the theme of the Godfather without ever mentioning Italians or the Mafia or violence or any of that stuff. The themes of the Godfather, you talk about family and the dynamics of family, and loyalty and all kinds of things like that. So you could talk about themes separate from what your story's about. And I encourage people to really uh, look into the thing they're working on thematically. And so that they could find what I call a North Star that guides them or pulls them through the process. And this theme notion, which which I agree with you, it's fun, you know, so what's it about? It's the human condition. Um, it, I, I'm, the great pitch incorporates the theme as well as the story. It tells you the story as well as the theme in the pitch and the telling. So that the listener of it understands that this is going to be a character going through a human story and learning something, and we, the audience, are going to learn something. Wait, ideally, are you saying when you pitch it, you should say what the theme is? I, I the best pitches it have the theme encapsulated inside it. You mean implied, but not correct. stated? Okay. Correct. Correct. And they, if it's stated, it's stated, but it ideally implied. <laughs> I was going to say because when you hear that, when I heard that it's about the human condition, my brain no, shut down. No, without yeah. doubt. Yeah. But if they said, but if they said, you know, it's about the struggle of this priest going through this blah 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 blah, blah and how he overcomes his his lack of faith and regains faith by the end by way of his journey, then you begin to realize, oh, it's about faith, <laughs> and you begin to realize that that is the themes, and I think the themes are are important. It's funny, um, I found that Columbia, they are very thematic and they can write you essays about what they're working on without working on the thing they're working on. <laughs> uh, I mean, they're trained at that. And at, at NYU, they could write, 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 and not tell you at all what they're working on. It's the exact opposite. Um, you'll find that there's more money as writers to be able to do the second than the first but the better stuff comes from a combination of the two. You want work that has thematic content. Whenever I'm looking at a story or a concept, I'm trying to look behind the, <coughs> behind the actual events and saying, what does this mean? What is the bigger meaning for this? And, but that's me. And I always put a triangle up on the board and say on the top, the triangle, character, theme, and story slash structure. That's the kind of the holy triangle of, of narratives as far as I'm concerned. And, and you know, I don't, I don't pick one. I say each individual tends to enter the, a story or the, north, the, the sense of story through one of these windows, typically. You know, so 
when I look at the movie section in the newspaper, what appeals to me? And again and again, it's the <laughs> ideas, and that's me. I kind of, I kind of approach things on the theme level. Me. Uh, someone else may approach things on a character level. It's a goofy character, a unique character, or someone else has a, a snippet of story, and that story sense will compel them to to go further in the story. And that doesn't have to be your brain wiring. It could be, but it could just be the, your own predilection. So I, I think. Uh, to me, the great stuff has a huge, healthy dollop of those three things, theme, story, and character. And um, there are exceptions to the rule. Tarantino, I think, is you know really brilliant, but I, I don't think his things are about much um, thematically. I think after the fact, historically, we could look at them and say, oh, he was able to put abject violence and pop culture together in a way that had, had not been done previously. But in terms of the actual work, which I love his work, by the way, I don't, I don't, I don't, just, I don't find it thoughtful or provocative particularly afterwards, as much as I find that it's entertaining and he's eminently entertaining. So, you know, it, it's, it's really what you're like. Action movies tend, tend to have a lot less themes, but the great action movies tend to be more thematic. You know, so, I mean, including um, all of Cameron's work. You know, The Terminator is usually thematic, but it's also has a lot of action at the same time. So. So what's a good way for a writer to develop? What are some other steps or, or exercises or something kind of hands-on that can get a writer to develop an idea and to, and, and to kind of determine, say, to start and then develop it into a full movie from that idea? Well, I, I, would, I would focus on that triangle. And I'd literally make yourself spend some time and say, what is this movie about story-wise? That's always the struggle. But also, what is this movie about thematic-wise? You know, what are the operating idea or ideas that are running through your movie? And I find that the themes oftentimes take drafts to understand what it is you're writing about. You don't always know initially. You think, well, I, you know, I think it's about, you know, you know, the guy wants to win the rodeo, but really, he's just trying to please his dad. But his dad's an asshole. He hasn't really figured that out till three quarters of the way through the movie. <laughs> Is this a coming of age movie? He's really is it, is, it, is it learning about himself? Is it getting out of the getting under the, the shadow of a parent? These are the themes and the ideas that are inherent in that movie. And yet, so you don't want just action, action, action. You want to be able to explore all those. So I would really recommend on a practical level that you are aware of those ideas, meaning theme, character and the story itself. And don't just jump right into what happens next, what happens next. So give yourself a moment to think, what is this really about? And again, what it's really about, not story-wise, but what am I really talking about? Even if you're not even particularly aware of what you're talking about, ask yourself the question, what is it really about? Well, a lot of the classic kind of books or approaches to screenwriting say that they there has to be a main character, um, not a main character, a main character <laughs> <laughs> who has obstacles to overcome and I mean, I, I, do you believe that's a useful thought, or do you think that's kind of like a that that puts you into a box of kind of? You know? No, I think I, I think almost storytellers know that, like ride makers, if you make a monorail, it's less fun than a roller coaster, and roller coasters are have have obstacles in them, <laughs> and uh, so you know. I got up, I took a shower, I got on a train uh, from the from the city, and I'm here right now. Not a, not a particularly eventful story, you know. And I, same story, I got up, I took a shower, I got in the train, there's a huge boa constrictor in the train, what? It went wrapped around a person, I saw it eat somebody, I pulled the person out of the boa constrictor neck. Then I got my coat, I came here, and I'm sitting here now telling you the story. Better story. Better story, you gotta admit. So, it, it's not like I must get obstacles, I must entertain. I guess the other big note which I'm really pushing to people these days, is sit in the audience while you write these things. Be in the audience while you write these things. How, how would you respond if people did that or didn't do that? And, and get a real sense of, you know, what is it you're trying to do? Who, to who you, are you trying to entertain? And entertain it. Don't, don't be afraid of the, of the concept of entertaining. I mean, we are trying to dab, we're, we're snake charmers, and we're trying to charm our audience, it really are. So that doesn't mean to be 
heat or two. It means uh, charm. Well, looking at your triangle that I'm imagining. I can picture it. I don't yeah. know what um, so you know, we've talked about you talk a lot about theme, and you talk a lot about uh, uh, about story. So I feel like we should talk a little bit about character. Right. Um, so that's and that reminds me of another thing. I see Anne, Anne's not here, but uh, that separates the better scripts from the less strong scripts that we read had a lot to do with the characters, right? So, you know, a two-dimensional character speaking wooden dialogue is not as interesting, obviously, as a, a more multi-dimensional character. So looking at, you know, you're reading a lot of student work, um, do you have any thoughts or tips on how to better develop more realistic, engaging characters? Oh, good, uh, yeah. You well, know, not just student work, I mean, you know, just, I do a lot of consulting professionally, and I'm also writing my own stuff and getting docs on my own stuff. You know, agents and managers, and I'm involved in giving comments or friends and so forth and so on. It's really hard to do this thing. Um, but, you know, I think as John Gardner, who is a, a great novelist and also a teacher of, of writing uh, prose, I think he said, that, what is a great character is, uh, I, I, I think he just said a complex, interesting thing. <laughs> but that, that's more, that, that's a lot. I mean, what is a complex, interesting thing? Um, so when we look at characters, characters uh, are typically, like most of us, uh, have conflicts within ourselves. And so if that could be shown, that's good. That starts going to the complexity of character. Um, I, like, I, look, I, I kind of start people off by, and myself as well, saying what does a character want in the course of the movie? And I'll call that the outer goal. And then for the, and I also simultaneously say what is the inner goal? And I describe the inner goal as the unconscious or the less conscious motivation for the outer goal. So example, again, I'm the character and I want to win the rodeo, outer goal. My inner goal that I'm not conscious of is that I want to please my dad. Now, if I were super conscious of that, I'd put that in my outer goal. <clears throat> and at my act one, I'd probably have me going to a therapist. And I think, so what do you want? Well, I want to please my dad. Well, maybe you could win the rodeo. I don't know, to please your dad. <laughs> and then I'd say, well, what's the inner, what's my unconscious or less conscious motivation for, for wanting to please your dad? Well, because I feel ignored, or I feel less of a person, or my self-worth. I keep going lower and lower on the unconscious level of the character of the motivation of what they're doing consciously. These are things that I start off with, but I'm open to changing them. As you learn more about your story and this triangle, because ideal movies have this dovetail of character, story, and theme. Uh, one of the great examples of it is, is um, uh, Robert Town's great movie. Chinatown. Thank you, Chinatown. So uh, uh, that's a case where the character literally embodies the theme. So, in any case, y yes, good. I hope I answered some of that. Very much so. Yeah, good. Um, I, would, I always end up asking you because I like have interesting things and I like to hear you say, but I, I, I don't want to monopolize the conversation. No, you, go ahead. So I'm going to open it up to the audience to good. see what they want to talk about. Good. So if anyone has any questions for Lauren, you know, it's a good time. Uh, I'm not a trained screenwriter on wrote my first film, and I do right. write a bunch. I tend to write from uh, images I see in my head. Right. I don't know if that's like, that's a thing. Oh, good. Right. So. I don't think in terms of any of these rules or themes or anything. I write and then I just kind of go from there, and then I'll have people tear it apart from there and they'll <laughs> tell me things like you just said. Yeah. But I, I'm kind of afraid to learn some of them. I know that's kind of a common. No, no, I understand what you're saying. You yeah. don't want to. You don't want to have these ideas that are restricting you and putting you in. Yeah, I want to mess with instinct. Totally get it. Yeah. And so this, you know, I was asked recently <laughs> at, a, at a graduate school. Someone went three years and then they gave me their scripts. The students did, the, the faculty. And the idea was for me to read the scripts and to talk to the students. They graduated, right? And uh, I was supposed to talk to them, and I had not been with, they had not taken any of my classes. And my comment to the faculty, not to the student, was I see no indication of any instruction in this script. Now, that's a good thing if it's a good script. It's a horrible waste of money of three years in college. <laughs> <laughs> right? So 
if you could pull it off, <coughs> God bless you. And then just shape it from there. From if you could do it, I'm not going to pull it. But but if you are finding that people are reading the script and they're like a lot a lot of comments and a lot a lot of questions, it's not and it's not whooping their ass, and they're and they're sincere <coughs> from professionals, my friend. I like what you're reading. <laughs> you know, there are people. I mean, I, I remember seeing a screenwriter yeah. speak who <coughs> Preston Whitmore was his name. Was that something? Yeah. He he was about 20 years ago. Wrote a lot of like action and stuff. And he said that he would sit in his room and bang out a script in like 48 hours of nonstop writing. And obviously, for him, he sold something like 17 scripts in one year. He was talking about you know, yeah. But I mean, I, I, the idea of me doing that, I it takes me, you know. So so to that point, the demands are changing as well. And screenwriters, you know, professional script write, um, companies will have readers, and the readers will be given five, fifteen scripts a weekend to read. And they're they're not they they're kind of used to reading certain kinds of stuff. And I don't mean content-wise, but the way it's formatted, and the way the descriptions are. And so, when I said that comment that there's no indication of instruction, it means that it, that it could have been from anybody anywhere, and it wasn't working at all. By the way. Script. It wasn't working at all. It was like sad. It really was. Like, where were people? Where were people along the way saying you should be doing this? I'm not saying the sentences were horrible. I'm not saying it was illiterate. I'm just saying that there's a there's a there's a science and a craft to this stuff. You don't want to. You know, I'm sure that I could do some brain surgery without doing. You know, a lot of prep um, and get it right sometimes. Um, you know, so. And the creative act of sitting down here and seeing images, at least you're seeing images. <laughs> you know? So what I'm trying to what I'm trying to push on people is where to put that stuff. Okay. You know? I don't want to stop you from these, so where to put those all your stuff. I, I can say that Lauren is absolutely not anti-creative. He's very pro-creative. It's just that Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to put in a box at all. Yeah. Thank I you. have a question. Um, how what's your opinion and I'm curious what are your thoughts about um, structured screenplay versus uh, free flow screenplay. You have some amazing movies that were written by just someone, okay, just an empty page and just gonna start writing and see where it goes. And then you have films that are, okay, you have a treatment, you have all the acts together and you kind of figure out the story before you start. So I'm curious as to your opinion. Uh, what's an example of the free form one that you described? Um, Lady Bird was written in free form. So she was just hold blank page and just start writing. And, and a lot of those, um, some of those buddy comedies also, Stuff that's like a little bit so, so Lady Bird, you know, is lives with a pretty, pretty prominent screenwriter, producer, and she's lived with him for a number of years, and she's written with him and other people <coughs> and made movies for many years. So when that person does that, that's different from other people doing it. <laughs> Let's start with that. So when you talk about free form after you've been playing professionally in the screenwriting game for 10 years, I don't think it's free form anymore. You know, so, uh, and also if you analyze Lady Bird, and those of you who have not seen it, this is not giving much away, but a character in the first two minutes of the movie states her goal of the movie, yeah. A, and then she jumps out of a car, a moving car. <laughs> and basically she sets up her entire character in the first two minutes of the movie. I rest my case. Mm -hmm. If that's free form, it's really smart fucking. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, I have a question about your dialogue process. Sure. Like what do you what's your approach when you handle that? Do, you, do the conversation just kind of come to you? Do you have like a basic idea of where you want to see to go with how words are spoken like how about that? So great question. Um, and I'm actually writing a book on dialogue now. And there aren't many books in dialogue, and if you've gone to film schools, very few, well, none of them teach it. I, I, I taught it at Hofstra, actually, last year. Um, and the reason why very few people teach it, and the reason I never wanted to teach it, I created the class, because I didn't believe you could improve dialogue. I do now believe you can. Um, I believe you could improve your dialogue. I don't mean you could turn someone into Aaron Sorkin. Uh, so I could teach you to play the piano. I can't teach you to be a Thelonious Monk. You know, and there's these great screenwriting people who have great dialogue. Aaron Sorkin is among them. And, you know, but he has some rules as well in terms of if I asked you, can you hand me the cup in Aaron Sorkin dialogue, 
you'll say no. <laughs> because he's always looking to create a barrier within all the dialogue. And he's got to use that along the way. Um, so in terms of rules of dialogue, I don't have it. I think your first impulse to just get it all out dialogue is, is really important. Um, there's a, there are... The, Analyze the great dialogue. You know, the majority of the things that I'm pushing in my dialogue course, which I invented, was tuning your ears. So the assignment, I'm giving you, here it is, do it for free. I have, once a week, come in with four pages of overheard dialogue that other people don't know that you're, that you're not jumping down. Oh, go into a cafe and write down the dialogue. Write down your roommates and your parents' dialogue that they don't know what's going on. That's the rule. You, they cannot know that you're dictating the dialogue. Mm -hmm. Listen, change your ear. You start hearing it like you've never heard before. Listen. And you'll see that if you just write down the dialogue, you can start, the characters start appearing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's amazing. They, you, can, you don't have to have much description of them. They just appear uh, from their dialogue. And people don't talk, um, well, they say they have a lot of ums. They have dashes. They don't have complete sentences. They're not linear. For starters, so I don't know if that helps, but yeah, the big don't note is I wouldn't rely on dialogue. You know, you want to you you, you want to have a sound structure, a sound dramatic structure that the dialogue is like coding. Okay, I have a lot of people say, then beat five, we learn this thing, and the, and the two characters talk, and I I always kind of oh my god, you know, that's the monorail. That's the you know, unless you're like a great musician, I don't want to hear you. Practice the piano. <laughs> <laughs> and can I say one thing to this? Is because your this conversation, what you said, is awesome. It's operating right here, though, kind yeah. of like at the brink of professionalism. Yeah, yeah. Can I take it back down to the good. beginning a little bit? Good, one good. thing I see in the submissions, you know, is exposition. You should go through a script line by line and ask yourself, is this exposition? Because there's nothing that feels more false than exposition. The example I'll give. From a script is one character, two characters who have lived in a town for 30 years and have known each other for 30 years. One says to the other, um, "Oh, the guy was up at so and so," and the other guy says, "Yeah, where they process the chemicals." And I'm like, "We need to know that as an audience." But why in the world would two people who live in the same town for 30 years and know each other for 30 years tell the other one what they both clearly already know, yeah. right? And that is the kind of thing where you can be Aaron Sorkin, but if you're doing that, it's still going to stink, right? So you need to get over the kind of basic idea that that you should never be, be telling the story through dialogue. At least at an tell. explicit, yes. yes. You're, you're, you're telling, but you're telling right. through the dialogue. Now the dot, right, the dot, exactly. So that, that's not good. So to that point, you say in movies that characters are what they do more than what they say. We, we, in, a, in a prose, you can describe the inner life of a character. In movies, their actions will tell us what they do. Now that being said, we love great dialogue on things. And, and to the degree that you can, you know, dazzle us, that's, that's a cool thing. In terms of the, in terms of the exposition, it, there are ways to do that rather than saying, <coughs> You know, as you know, Mitch and I are sitting up in front of you right now. You know, we can see that. Uh, but but th if we wanted to get that across without that, we'd say, where am I? I mean, you know, <laughs> so there's no ways. But isn't the dialogue supposed to, un to uh, surface the, sub the subtext between the, of the conflict between two people? You think of it that way, you'll always write great dialogue. Because you're <laughs> right. I'm about great. Well, <laughs> good. Yeah. Except them. Well, you know, a lot of times it's work, I call it workmanlike dialogue. You know, you just get, like Carpenter. We just got to like get from here to there and got to say the basic stuff. Oh, yeah. Hey, yeah. how you doing? Hi. Uh, my name is Brian Shaw and I'm an actor first and foremost. Great. Uh, secondly, I've ne never written anything screenplay wise. Um, I just want to know what would, what would you suggest would be like my first steps of writing anything period. Do you do some oh guess? yeah, it is good. well journal writing is what I always recommend. So you wake up in the morning and you write and remember what you wrote, remember what you did the day before. In other words, you write it even if it starts a list. The day before, make your mind remember where you were, what you did, and expand on that. It's just journal writing. Recall what you did the day before. And do it on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'd like 
Do you make comments about the hero's journey? I read the writer's journey, and um, I found it sort of hard to quite grasp. And I did then write a hero's journey script, but I don't know that I quite understood what I was what I was trying to come across with. And I just wanted to. Keep I, I actually love the hero's journey and teach a lot about it. And they actually have given separate lectures yeah. to people about the subject. So. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the hero's journey, uh, Joseph Campbell is sort of the one attributed with codifying the hero's journey. And theoretically and or practically what he did was take legends and stories and myths from around the world. And before there were computers, he put it in his mental computer and kicked out a commonality for all myths and all stories. And he called that the monomyth, the one myth, that was his term, the monomyth. And the monomyth is a, so 12 basically steps of a character going through a, an arc. And the arc is, starts in a normal world, gets called to an adventure, they resist the adventure, they speak with a mentor, and the mentor helps them take on that thing that they were called for, that's called cross the first threshold. And that parallel typically act ones in movies, typically. Uh, so we, there's a, there's a lot of humanity connected to this. You know, when you call me and say, Lauren, you want to go out tonight? I may resist for a second. That's the refusal of the call, that second. Or I may say, nah, and you talk me into it. And then you become my mentor as you talk me into it. You know, on a very commonplace level, we go through the hero journey all the time. So I appreciate, I really do. Uh, the, I think the, I'll give you two things that I've gleaned from the hero journey which have been helpful for me. The first is, if you could s simplify it to three things. Uh, separation, initiation, return. Separation, initiation, return. Which typically is act one, two, and three. Separate from the normal world, going through something, an initiation in order to be accepted into the return, and you return with the elixir, you're changed at the end. So it's a diagram of personal growth. That's what the hero journey is. It keeps you on the roller coaster instead of the monorail. <laughs> well, you know, you know, I, I hadn't even thought that way because it's for such an internal, it's yeah. such a really an internal arc. This, it, these actions that you do, roller coaster act things, are symbolic of the inner of of the inner growth. Right, right, right. And and I was going to say something. I said there were two things, and the second one I forgot. Uh, but I'll, 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 I'll come up with it. It was interesting to fit it into a three-act structure, but also use the hero journey 12 steps. And it was just, at some point, I sort of thought, okay, I have enough information in my head, I just have to write. Um, oh, yeah. You know, I, I hear you. It wasn't quite... Yeah, yeah, I get it. You know, the helpful part of the, of the hero journey also, for me, is that the call to adventure is a call that the person doesn't know why they're called. <laughs> By the end, they figure out why. So you asked me to go on a treasure hunt with you, and I go, and I think I'm going for money, but the real reason I was called will be revealed down the line. And I feel that's true in life. Wait, and there's a book by Christopher Vogler. Vogler, that's right. The one that the right. Yeah. So to give you just a little practical insight, when I was in development, my boss required me to read the Vogler book before I read a script, and basically said that this is the basis of movies, and you should be able to apply this to a movie, whether it's a romantic comedy, an action movie, a drama about addiction, it doesn't matter. That this this basic story arc, this traditional story arc, should apply to every single movie. So, so I, have so a I have a problem with that. Christopher but. Vogler's The Hero... So, it's Christopher Vogler, V-O-G-L-E-R, yeah. and... He was a Disney exec who wrote a memo, <laughs> and it, it started making the rounds, and it became a book. Yeah, yeah he is, so Christopher Vogler was uh, <coughs> ostensibly a reader for Disney and began to, after reading Joseph Campbell's work, began to see that the Joseph Campbell mo monomyth <laughs> fit most of the Disney classics. So he applied it to it and wrote a whole memo about it and turned it into a book. I have a problem with the book. I think it's a great starter book and you shall read it, but I think he tends to try to make heroes out of secondary characters. And I think it gets confusing, as you're saying. And like, you read all these things. I, I find these books really, really troublesome because I find that after they make sense after you've written four or five scripts, not before. Well, the other thing is, and maybe, it, I don't know if you agree with this, but to me it's like if you try and do exactly what these books say, you end up with a formulaic script. But if you learn lessons from the books that you can apply 
within a, a, a legitimate structure that helps you flesh out and overcome problems and things like that. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, again, to that point, separation, initiation, return. You, s all stories of separation from something. I mean, I'm here and now start the story. Well, I have to leave here to start the story. Separate from from it, and then you go through something and arrive somewhere else. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, you touched on something with the dialogue about turning things more into action. And I'm learning as I'm writing more scripts, and my next script I'm approaching directors, and I'm learning this little tug of war where directors want to show more than you write. And, and then I'm being told that, well, instead of saying this, we show it in an action. And do you have a, a technique or any kind of like thought on that where like, I like this, I like saying this, I want to say it this way, but a director tends to want to more show it. And can we maybe show it? you got to find a compromise, I'm sure. Do you have any kind of a thing on that? I think, but first of all, I apologize. You should be calling people, not me. I, I noticed that. But I'll let so, it slide. So, 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 I, I want to acknowledge that I'm uh, taking over here. I'm, 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 I'm giving the floor back to you. You're the smart one. At least let me call him the. No, 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 I'm the bossy one. So I'll let you pull it back. Can, can he speak? Yes. Okay. I speak. I do it anyway. I apologize. All right. Uh, um, to that point. Um, the directors want to hear the characters talk if they're talking great shit. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, ideally, you know, I wrote I wrote a couple of scripts with a an old school. He actually died two years ago. Uh, screen I wrote Parallax View and Three Days of the Condor and a lot of old great movies. And he used to say, "Have them speak exposition when they're hanging from a rope." So in other words, if the things are really tense, and this is what Tarantino does all day long. Then you can talk about hamburgers. I mean, they can talk about it. They can talk. The director will allow your talking if the setup of the situation is already very compelling. Okay. That's and if any director says they want to, let's say, tell them that that Fincher directed the Social Network, right? He didn't yeah. look at the Social Network script and say, "Oh, I can't direct this. There's too many Sorkin words," <laughs> right? Yeah. And so you know, that's good advice. Right. I think we have one more. Um, I actually have two questions. First question is... Um, sure. Everyone's taken over. I <laughs> <laughs> uh, Do you have a writing routine, like how many pages you, you got to hit in order to get the script finished on time uh, by a certain deadline? Or, and also, the second question is, um, how do you decide um, that you want to commit to a specific story for your next project? Both those are uh, can be difficult questions. The first one is real simple. If you pay me a lot of money by Monday, it'll be done by Monday. <laughs> Real simple. And the more you pay me, the more uh, assured it'll be done by Monday. <laughs> uh, and, and, so, and it's really it's simple. Uh, the challenge is not being paid. So you say it needs to be done by a certain point. And this goes to your second question, the discipline of writing. Um, you know, there will be people who, and there's all kinds of apocryphal stories of writers, and they get up and do so much every day. I've been in this writing world in my entire life, and uh, for every rhythm and journey that someone has, it changes a year later or two years later. No, it, it's very hard to be consistent on this stuff. So if you, you know, depending where you are, you know, you have to make artificial deadlines for yourself. By next month, on a certain day, I want to be a certain place. I want to finish the basic concept. So then you have to put in time for that. And it's time intensive. I find writing the most inefficient thing known to humankind. <laughs> Usually inefficient. As I seem to be doing, you're giving a good answer at this level. Can I give a little? Yes. <laughs> so like I, when I started writing scripts 20 something years ago, I, I went to one of these things. And someone said something that really stuck with me, which is, you know, you need to set aside a certain amount of time, whatever fits within your schedule, whether it's an hour, whether it's five hours, whether it's 15 minutes, to write every day because writing is hard. And it's very, very easy to not do it because it's hard, especially when you're starting out and you're trying to figure out the rules and think about all the questions that have come up, right? These are all going in your head at the same time as you're creating. And what this person said was, as long as you are sitting in front of a computer with a document up, you're not, this is before the internet, but you're not, you're not watching TV, you're not listening to music, you, you're not reading another book, you're up in front of it, and you've fulfilled your time. In other words, that's you can sit in front of an empty Word doc for an hour, that's your hour writing. It's not the pressure of getting it done by a certain day or whatever, but it's getting you to sit and actually think about this stuff, because if you're forced, if you're forcing yourself, 
to spend an hour a day or 15 minutes a day or whatever that number is, it forces you to kind of like get over that threshold of dealing with all of how hard this all you're, is. You're really right, and you're right that I kind of didn't talk with that. On that level, it is hard, and I call what you just said my version of active procrastination. <laughs> get I, I divide it, to my inactive procrastination is I gotta go see a movie because it might help me think about it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my inactive procrastination. Uh, and my active procrastination is sitting in front of the computer. Thinking. And, yeah. well, creeping up on it, <laughs> you know. And then when I get further in, but I think that's a really good note to give yourself, assign yourself some, some time every day or, or whatever your schedule can permit and, and torture yourself. Yeah, because it's hard, right? So unless you have something pushing you through, it's very easy to pull back and say, like, I'm overwhelmed by this idea, I'm overwhelmed by how to write good dialogue, I'm overwhelmed by whatever, and you just shut down. This keeps you from shutting down. Yeah, good job. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. I, I have a workshop uh, that I do in the city. If you want to even be on the list, there's a, there's a thing you can put your name and email. Just, but just do it oh, really it's clear. The back. Oh, we're, 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 it's over there, right? Just make it really clear because uh, if your handwriting is even remotely close to mine, it's illegible. So, okay, thank you. Thanks. <laughs>